All right. Welcome to Serenade and Soul, Mariachi Zeko. Hosts here, Andre. Uh, Daniel. Rogelio. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Richard Carranza. Hi, everybody. Hey, how y'all doing? Doing great on this cold Sunday. Oh, Sunday yeah. Very cold. <laughs> it's really cold. Nice and cold. And rainy, like misty. Mm -hmm. Nice and. But I mean, I honestly, I prefer this a lot more over like what the summertime is like. Yeah. Kinda. The, that, like, those 105 degrees. <laughs> 105, 107. Nah, I. You mean you don't like 107 degrees? Oh, you're from Arizona, right? <laughs> you're used on, to I mean, like, three I'm piece, used three, three piece traje, you know, 107 <laughs> degrees. I mean, not, nah, I mean, it's definitely, I'm used to it. It's black, just like, shiny black boots. <laughs> yeah, black. Yep. Yeah. Oh, right in the sun. All the lacquers are melting off of your instrument. Oh, goodness. And yeah, oh, it's yeah. right on your face. Yep. And then you look, when you're done, you're like, why is my instrument like kind of like, like sweaty <laughs> what, on? What, what is, is this? What is this? Am I looking at it? Yeah. Now you're used to the heat, though. You're from Arizona, right? From Arizona, yeah. yeah I'm used to that. And they say it's a dry heat. It doesn't matter. Right. It's heat. Yeah. Yeah. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. It's hot. Man, what town in Arizona? Tucson. Mm. Tucson. Tucson, Happy. Arizona. Man, I oh, lived uh, for like two years. We lived in uh, Las Cruces. Oh, it's a great, great, great city. Yeah, man. I, I would love to go back to New Mexico someday. It's a good place. They, you know, they have a very long, long-running mariachi conference in Las yeah. Cruces. Dude. I always wanted to go to yeah. that one. Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah. Yeah, so they do it right in Las Cruces, too. All right. First week of school. How are you guys feeling? Feeling good. Good. I got a big head start on my assignments. Yeah. <laughs> this is probably the biggest head start I'm gonna get all semester. Oh yeah. But it's all. Yeah. Don't let it. Uh, it's only downhill from here. But hey, we're gonna we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna push here. through. We're gonna push through for bees this semester. Yeah. <laughs> get to get that, that GPA up. What's your what's your well if you're comfortable. If you're comfortable saying saying it for you know. My GPA right now. Your GPA right now. Ooh. I'm not comfortable saying that. It's, it, it's not bad, but it's not like... It's, it's like, it's not like... It's not bad, but when I compare it to everyone else's, when they're like, oh, it's GPA, and I, I, I them, feel like I feel like mine might be around the same area as yours. Mine's definitely lower than both of yours, but... <laughs> At one point, it was like a... No, nah, okay, that's, 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 it was too low. Like, <laughs> too, it was like academic probation level, so... Dang! Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he's taking a lot harder classes. You're an engineering well, that's, major. That's yeah. right, that's fair. Right. That's very cool. Engineering. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's great. Remember, GPA is good, but advancing. Mm -hmm. Just remember, you can just advance. Every, every semester, better and better. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's pretty much the goal at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're shooting for. Good. This semester. Yeah. What was your time in college like? I loved college. Um, you know, got really involved with student government, got involved. I was a RA. In one of the dorms. Mm, how was that? So that was fantastic. It was a good experience, good leadership experience. But I gigged all the way through uh, college, so I was still doing mariachi music and, and and you know going to school. So for me, it was it was like one big blur, but it was a positive blur, mm -hmm. you know, in my in, in my memory. And you went all the way to your doctorate degree. Well, I what I've done is I've taken all my doctoral degrees. Uh, <laughs> I got to a point called ABD, which is all but dissertation. Uh -huh. So I did two doctoral degrees, and then um, when I got to the point of finishing the, doc the dissertation, I ended up getting promoted to another, you know, bigger job. So I'm um, ABD, which is all but dissertation. But took all the classes twice, uh, and at some point, you know, I'll finish that big book report. <laughs> <laughs> right. What what is what does a dissertation like consist of? Well, what you're doing is you're you're actually contributing to the body of knowledge um, on a on a given topic. Right. So you know you know there's a lot of people doing a lot of research every year. So you know you can have something that really speaks to you, and you do research on it from the very beginning, the history, the etymology. If you have a leadership framework. Um, and then you do a, a literature review where you look at what's been written about your topic mm -hmm. um, in the past. Uh, or you can also take somebody else's research that's already done a dissertation or a book, and then you pick it up from where they left off. Right. Uh -huh. you know, so they've only done it to here, 
So you take it from there, and then you go on and you study what else has been written, what else has been <clears throat> implemented. So there's a lot of different ways of doing a dissertation. But it's basically you're contributing to the body of knowledge um, on a given topic. And what was yours about? <clears throat> so my first one was on uh, the effects of student uniforms mm. in a high school environment. Because at the time it was very typical. Right. And I'm old, yeah. so yeah. you moved on beyond oh. that now. Um, but then the, the second one was actually the etymological effects of uh, school improvement grants on, on uh, minority and, and uh, historically disadvantaged populations, which to this day, I'm still interested in. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. still very live and well. Like, yeah, absolutely. Right. How did your position at um, in Sa San Francisco come to be? <clears throat> so I was, it's kind of a long story, Andre. So I was, um, when I graduated from high school, uh, I graduated from Pueblo High School in Tucson. Mm. And that was on the south side. And on the south side of Tucson, it was kind of considered not the place to really be. You know, it was considered kind of the bad part of town. Oh, it was like sketchy. But I loved the south side of Tucson. I still have friends, and you know, it was a great place to be. Uh, so I graduated from Pueblo, Pueblo High School, went to the University of Arizona, gigged my way through college, got done with a teaching degree. I came back to Pueblo, the high school I graduated from, mm -hmm. and I did my student teaching, and then I got hired as a teacher at Pueblo High School. So I was a bilingual um, American government and world history teacher at Pueblo High School. And absolutely loved it. Yeah. Loved it. Lived three blocks away from the school. It was great. But I was still gigging. So invariably what would happen is on you know Monday mornings, you know, kids in my government class or my world history class would come and say, hey sir, was that you I saw this weekend? <laughs> That's like, depends on where you saw me. <laughs> but they would say, no, it was my cousin's quinceanera and there was a mariachi and I thought that was you. And sure enough, I'd be, yeah, yeah, I played a mariachi. And, you know, the students got really excited because there was no mariachi program at the high school. Um, the band, the orchestra, the choir program, they existed, but they weren't really strong. And, and you, know, they, you know, my high school was like 91% you know, you know, Mexican American, Mexican, and they're like, no, we want to do mariachi, we want to do mariachi. So I started giving guitar lessons after school in my in my social studies classroom, mm -hmm. um, and before you you knew it, the students came and said we want a mariachi program. So it was my first lesson in uh, how to organize kids. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, you got to do a petition, and you got to sign the petition, that, you know, wanting to establish a mariachi program, but it can't be just you. Get all your friends to sign it. Get your parents to sign it. Get their parents to sign it. And if you can get 200 signatures, I'll get you a meeting with a principal. Um, and sure enough, within a week, they had they didn't get 200 signatures. They got over 300 signatures. Oh, jeez. So it was it was one thing after another. They they petitioned. They they got a meeting with a principal. You know, the principal came to me and said, "Hey, Carranza, what are you doing?" And I'm like, you know, I'm preparing for my next class. He's like, no, no, what are you doing with the kids? I was like, well, you know, you know, they want to play music. So he was he was really, really forward thinking. So we got a mariachi program going. Now, Andre asked a very simple question. I'm giving him a very long-winded answer. So what ended up happening is that that mariachi program got established over 35 years ago. It's still in existence at that high school right, right. now. Dang. Very successful. Um, and... What ended up happening is in establishing that mariachi program, I was going to die a high school bilingual social studies teacher. I loved it. Was not ready to go into administration. They're going to carry me out feet first for my classroom. But the whole process of establishing that mariachi program and the abject racism that I faced, where I had the orchestra teacher saying, well, I can't be affiliated with the program because I can't teach kids to play out of tune. Like that stereotype. You know, the trumpet, trumpet, the band teacher saying, well, I can't be part of your program because I can't be part of teaching music that's played in bars for drunks to kids. Like the abject racism, like really pissed me off. Yeah. Right. So I thought, well, either I'm going to keep complaining about it or I'm going to do something about it. So that's when I went and 
did my classwork and my coursework and got my master's in administration and I decided, you know what, I'm going to be, I can have this kind of a impact in my classroom, but as an administrator, maybe I can have a bigger impact on the school. And that's where I first thought about ever becoming an administrator. And lo and behold, I became an assistant principal eventually, then I became the principal of the same high school, was really excited. And then in Las Vegas, um, the Las Vegas uh, Academy, which is a performing arts high school. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they had a vacancy for principal. And because of the work I had done around the country, um, a lady named Marcia Neal, who was the, the, the music arts administrator, knew me. So she recommended me to the, to the superintendent and said, hey, you know, we, our next principal should have somebody with a musical background. I know this principal in Tucson, and he's got a musical background. He'd be great. So I interviewed for that position. I got the position. Nice. But I got that position in January. They wanted me to start in February, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. My semester isn't over till May, right. uh -huh. and I'm not going to leave my school in the middle of the second semester, so I have to turn down your, your, your offer. Oh. And I thought, okay, <laughs> shut my foot. I'm never going to be able to go back there. But to their credit, they reached out. They offered me another job. Um, so at the end of that year, I moved to Las Vegas as a high school principal, eventually became a region superintendent. And my superintendent in, in Clark County was a guy that is still like, he's, a, he's my brother, he's like a, a father to me, he's a mentor, his name is Carlos Garcia. Carlos got hired to be superintendent in San Francisco. Oh. So he called me and he said, hey, there's going to be an opening for deputy superintendent, you should apply. He didn't say you have a job, I'm going to hire, he said you should apply. So that's when I applied to go to San Francisco from Las Vegas, and then I ended up in San Francisco and... Loved every minute of it. It's beautiful. It's cool. Thank you. Man, so you saw like a lot of parts of like the country pretty much by the time. Yeah, I mean, so I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. It's the West Coast, West. So then I, I, I you know, I worked in Las Vegas. Uh, then I went to the West Coast, San Francisco. I spent seven years in San Francisco. <clears throat> From there, I got recruited to go to Houston. Mm -hmm. Houston ISD. So I was superintendent in Houston ISD. Wow. Uh, and then uh, from Houston, I got recruited to go to New York City to be the chancellor of the New York City Public Schools. Damn. So I've lived West Coast to East Coast and Midwest. I, I guess, you know, growing up, my mom always used to say, don't ever let anybody say you get around. <laughs> but I guess I've gotten around. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the great covering city. all of the yeah. bases. Yeah, for sure. And going back a little bit, like going from Houston and then immediately chancellor of new york public schools that's yeah. like it's a big i mean that's a huge big like, jump as far as like like how did that like come about or? yeah so you know i think my my trajectory has always been to work in large school systems so when i was in um when i was in tucson my school was 2500 kids when i went to las vegas my high school was 4500 students but the school district in las vegas was 215,000 kids it was the fifth largest school district in america at the time mm -hmm. Uh, and then I went to San Francisco. That was that was about 55, 59,000 students, big school district. Um, and then when I went to Houston, it was the seventh largest in the country, and it was it was about two hundred ten thousand students at the time. So then I went from Houston to New York City, which is the largest school system in America. And at the time I was there, it was one point one million students. So it was so big that I used to remind people every time you know there's about three hundred. 310 million residents in the United States. Mm -hmm. So every day that New York City was in session, one out of 300 Americans was sitting in one of our classrooms. Right? That, that's kind of the massiveness and the importance of kind of the work that we did there. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, obviously I'm an educator and I love being an educator, but everywhere I ever went, whether it was Tucson, Las Vegas, San Francisco, Houston, New York City, I always found a mariachi locally and I gigged, always. And people would say to me, but you're the superintendent, you can't gig, or you're the chancellor, you yeah. can't gig. It's my town, yeah. so what am I gonna do? Yeah. And I think it also speaks, uh, so I think beautifully to our movement yeah. that mm -hmm. think about just my little experience, those five cities, big cities, 
there was a mariachi in every one of those cities. Right. And none of them knew me. And it was a matter of, well, yeah, you know, I play mariachi. You do play mariachi? Well, let's see what you can do. And then all of a sudden we played the Sonata Negra. They, okay, this guy can play. It's like, <laughs> hey, you want to go gig? So it's it's one of those things that I always, I always tell students is that once you become a mariachi, you're part of this bigger family that you don't even know yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter where you go, where there's a mariachi, you're going to be able to be, find your, your, your tribe, if, yeah. if, if you will. Uh, and then, I mean, don't even get me started about, about San Antonio. I mean, I, I feel like I am so blessed to live in San Antonio. I'll tell you that story uh, maybe a little later in our podcast. All right, nice. So out of every city that you've been to, it's like either worked in or lived there, where is your favorite out of all of them? Man, that's a hard question. I think it's because, you know, every city had its own particular um, nuance that I loved about the city. Um, you know, Tucson is my hometown. There's a really rich traditional mariachi, you know, culture in Tucson. Uh, Las Vegas, when I went to Las Vegas, I was, I was, I contributed to them starting their mariachi programs in their school systems. Now Las Vegas probably has that one school district has probably the largest number of in-school mariachi programs anywhere in the country. They're good. You know, which is oh, yeah. really, really incredible. Um, so I was really proud of that. In San Francisco, we started the first mariachi program in San Francisco when I was superintendent there. Uh, in Houston, they already had mariachi programs, but we, I, I supported the mariachi programs. And it was one of those things, you remember when I said, you know, I was a teacher and I love being a teacher, but I wanted to have bigger influence. Well, one of the, one of the, I'll give you an example about that. So most fine arts programs, um, they have a kind of a rotation for uniforms. Mm -hmm. So every seven years, the band, the orchestra, and the choir will get new uniforms every seven years. But what I found when I was superintendent is that the mariachi program never got included in that. It's like you go fundraise for your uniforms. So in every school district that I was superintendent, I made sure that the mariachi program was included in that seven-year rotation. Now, mariachi programs, they, they, you know, the mariachis, they, they, would, they would fundraise, but it was because they wanted to get new uniforms in a different color or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they knew that every seven years now, they were a legitimate part of that rotation going for that's an example of what I wanted to do mm -hmm. is to bring that kind of a perspective to that decision-making chair to be able to support that um, so I love that about Las Vegas San Francisco we started the program I, I you know San Francisco was a great experience uh, Houston was a phenomenal experience except we had a little thing called Hurricane Harvey oh. you know, the mm -hmm. superintendent so that really, really hit the city hard, and I was really proud to have been part of the team that kind of helped them recover from, from Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and then New York City, I mean, New York is New York. Yeah, right. You know, in every way, shape, or form, you know, the, the food, the culture, the hustle and bustle, the bigness of the city, the transportation, you know, the... the the beautiful aspect of all these different cultures coming together and then some of the crazy aspects of people coming together as well. So New York was just a really great experience um, and you know after New York you know I, I, my wife and I wanted to get, wanted to come somewhere where we felt like we were home. Like we could go and we could get ourselves a great taco or we could go and we could get ourselves you know, just a nice opportunity to go listen to some Tejano music and then watch some mariachi music and, you know, and get a nice margarita. And, and like, San Antonio have great people. San Antonio was all of those things. And, again, I'll tell you the story of how I fell into San Antonio in a minute. Mm -hmm. But every one of those cities, there was something that I just really, I, I made myself find what was good in those cities. Right. And I'm glad I did. Give you a perspective to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Man, so that's awesome. Like, every city, just there being a mariachi group. So would you say that there's, like, a difference between, like, finding a mariachi in, like, Texas or, like, how it is in Texas versus, like, in New York? Yeah. Because, like, I don't know. I kind of imagine that New York mariachis, like, I would, I guess, maybe, like, a little harder to find or, like, maybe not as prominent as it would be in, like, Texas or, like, in San Francisco? Well, they're not, they're not as prolific 
as they are in Texas. But yeah, right? I should probably say Polish. Yeah, but there are some great mariachis. I mean, right. Mariachi Tapatio de Álvaro Paulino right, Jr. Right, right. Is, in, is in New York City. They're great. Uh, 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 Manuel Ponce has a mariachi in, in New York City as well. He's got a great mariachi there as well. Um, just good people doing some good work. And um, I, I find that, you know, mariachi musicians, you know, I, will, will travel. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> they'll, they'll do their thing yeah. no matter where they are, right? So I have found some really great examples of mariachis uh, all, over, all over the country. Uh, and, you know, I think to a certain extent, we get a little spoiled in San Antonio. Oh, because, yeah. It's very mm -hmm. Like, you throw a rock, you're going to hit a mariachi. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, so we get a little spoiled. But, um, but in San Antonio as well, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, as we speak, Mariachi Camperos de, de, de Chuy Guzman in Los Angeles. One of the big show groups. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a fan of the Camperos since I was a kid. Uh, but right now, the Camperos have, if, if I'm not mistaken, five Tejanos yes. in, their, in their ensemble, right? On violin, guitarron. I mean, think about that. And think about Los Angeles, which is kind of like the epicenter also. I mean, there's a direct, uh, <coughs> there's a, there's a direct highway from Mexico City to Los Angeles. And these incredible mariachi musicians. And they've got five Tejanos, man, in San Antonians. In that ensemble, just tearing it up. Yeah, like that—that that is something to be really proud of. The fact that we have some incredible musicians in San Antonio, and, and I think that's also part of why it's important to celebrate who we are, right? You know, and, and what we do in, 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 in the music that we have in San Antonio. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you want to know how I fell in love in San Antonio? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah no, by all means. All right, because I got stories, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to talk yeah. a lot. I talk a lot. This is what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was 1979, before any of you were born. 1979, I was a 12-year-old kid in Tucson, Arizona. And I was part of a community mariachi group called Los Changuitos Feos. Have you ever heard of Los Changuitos Feos before? Yes. I don't. I have, yeah, no, I no, it's, it's, they're, they're, I mean, like... Uh, mariachi like, history, uh, they're like mentioned, yes. It's the first so youth Kingdom mariachi group right. in the United States. 1964, they were formed. Uh, and they were formed like Mariachi Cobre, Randy Carrillo, Steve Carrillo, Israel Molina, all those guys. They used to be part of the Changuitos Feos, right? So I was a Changuito Feo, right? And this is in 1979. Uh, and they were named Changuitos Feos because um, the, the patriarch, the guy who kind of brought them together, they came together at a at a church called Holy Family Catholic Church, and, and it was kind of a, there was a priest from Chicago, Father O'Rourke, that was a jazz musician, and he saw these kids, and they had talent, and so he, like, picked up the guitarron and taught himself guitarron and formed this little group, and he would say, mis changuitos feos, right? As, as a term of endearment, yeah. Yeah. they became mariachi los changuitos feos, right? So anyway... I was a chango in 1979. My brother was too. I have a, a twin brother, by the way. Oh yeah. Um, so we were we were members of this uh, community youth group. It wasn't affiliated with any one school. It was a community youth group. So we get to practice one day. And at the time, 1979, we had the the long, the long play records, yeah. right? The, the long play the the records. Yes. And I I we probably had in our house every album that Maria Chivargas at Tecalitlan had recorded up until then, and maybe multiple copies, because we used to scratch those records. We used to listen to them so much, trying to get the manicos and trying to understand what they were playing. We would just listen to them and listen to them and listen to them, and we'd scratch it so we'd go get another one. Um, so Maria Chivargas to us was like the Beatles, right, to, to other kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? They were like our rock stars. Um, so... We go to practice one one evening, and the director of the of the mariachi says, "Okay, guys, um, there's going to be the very first mariachi conference ever, and the teachers at this mariachi conference is going to be Mariachi Vargas at Tecalitlan, and we're going to go." We're like, "What? <laughs> we're going to do what? <laughs> right?" And he said, "It's in San Antonio, Texas." So, like, we were beside ourselves, and 
it, and sure enough, 1979, September 1979, Mariachi Vargas, first conference, Juan Ortiz and Bell, yeah. San Miguel Ortiz were the organizers. Miss Bell and Mr. Juan, I met them back then, right? Yeah, um, I'm 12 years old. I'd never flown on a plane. I'd never traveled away from my parents. By you know, first time I'm traveling alone. We never stayed in a hotel without my parents. And all of a sudden, we're going as a youth group to San Antonio, Texas, to go take lessons with Maria Chivargas and perform. And we get here to San Antonio, and you know, we're part of a youth mariachi group. There was nobody else in Tucson. And all of a sudden, we get here, and there's kids our age playing mariachi music. It's the first time I met Roland San Miguel, right? <laughs> playing music. For, uh, Anthony Medrano, <coughs> playing music. I mean, like all of these guys, I mean, I didn't know they were going to be, you know, the luminaries they are now. Right. But yeah. like, we were a bunch of kids, yeah. Yeah. and all of a sudden there's other kids like us playing mariachi music. Like, we're not weird. Like, this is cool. Yeah. Like, this is a cool, yeah, we're, we're this the is, cool group. This is the norm here. Yes! And then, Everybody loves it here. and then forget about it. Mariachi Vargas comes out, and there's my my hero, Nati Santiago, the guitarron player, and there's Martin Luna, guitar player who used to whistle, Pepe Martinez, oh, yeah. Fede, Rigoberto, Heriberto Molina, Mario Santiago, like all of these, the OGs. just the OGs, yeah. the legends. And all of a sudden, they're right there, and we're taking pictures with them. And... They're signing our albums, and we're listening to their, to to their stories and their conversations. in 1979, and I just remember it was such an indelible memory for me because I had come to this city that I had never ever thought I was going to be in San Antonio, and the people were beautiful. They were welcoming. They were warm. They were warm. Every time we performed, people were just so excited about it. The food was get out of here. It was fantastic. <laughs> there were other kids my age that were playing mariachi music. Like mariachi was the thing. It wasn't a thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And it was at such a high level, and I just fell in love with San Antonio, <laughs> as, as as that junior high school kid. Uh -huh. uh, and then obviously fast forward, and, and you know we've talked a little bit about my professional trajectory, but. Right. You know, I, I came to San Antonio several other times, you know, for conferences and stuff. But in conferences, you never really leave the hotel or the conference yeah. center, right? You're just and back and forth. It's just it. back and forth. So in, in, in 2021, when um, I had announced that I was going to leave New York City, um, and I joined IXL Learning as their chief of uh, strategy and global development, and uh, my position is remote. I travel all over the world. Um, and, you know, they had said to me, you can live anywhere in the world. It's a remote position as long as you have two things. You have to have internet, reliable internet, yeah. and you have to have an international airport because you're going to travel. Other than that, you can live anywhere you want to live. So I looked at my wife uh, and I said, Babe, where do you want to live? And I think she was thinking Paris, <laughs> London, <laughs> Mexico City, yeah. right? And I don't blame her. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I think I know where I want to live. She said, where? I said, I want to live in San Antonio. Yeah. And she gave me a look at first like, what? San Antonio? <laughs> where was she from? From Texas. Oh, Texas, okay. and she, as, a, as a little girl, she lived in uh, Colorado as well. You know, my father-in-law's a, a preacher, so, you know, they moved a, a, a bit. But she's a Tex, she's a Tejana. Okay. And so she's a San Antonio. Uh, and it didn't take her long, maybe 10 minutes, and she said, you know what? Yes, San Antonio. That's a great place. So we decided to come to San Antonio because of that experience that I had when I was a kid. And then I get to San Antonio. And I have to tell this story, and I hope Anthony will forgive me. Uh, but, but I have to tell this story. So we get to San Antonio, we've moved into uh, our, our condo, and we're waiting for the movers to get here. And, you know, we've been, I've been driving from New York City, because when we drove from New York City, like the Ooh. movers took all the, all the furniture. They took all the furniture, but the oh. thing, we rented like a U-Haul. Like and you know what came in the U-Haul, right? And just drove it down from New York. From New York. You know what came in the U-Haul? Nothing. No. My instruments, my guitarrones, my guitars, my vihuelas, 
are plants and my, should I say tequila collection? Uh, <laughs> that came with us, yeah. right? You can move all the other furniture. I don't care if you break yeah, it. You're not breaking any of those, right. right? So we get there, we've got our stuff, and man, I had had a haircut in like three weeks. So, you know, I'm thinking, where am I going to get a haircut? So I remember I texted Anthony Medrano, who's my compadre, and I love him to death. Uh, him, my comadre Laura. Um, but I texted Anthony and I said, hey, bro, this is Richard Carranza. Because, you know, we had stayed in touch, but, you know, we were living in different places, you know? Yeah. Um, and I texted him and I said, hey, this is Richard Carranza. I said, I'm going to ask you a weird question. Is there anywhere you can re recommend for me to get a haircut? And then I remember almost immediately he texted me back and he says, well, you know, I'm just coming out of COVID. I haven't really had a haircut. Uh, but he says, uh, in what city? And I said, right here in San Antonio. And I remember he typed in big, big capital letter, what? <laughs> <laughs> so we met up, you know, that evening and it's like, I can't believe you're in San Antonio. Oh my God, this is great. You know, it's fantastic. So anyway, the rest is history. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how I fell in love with San Antonio. And I, and I'm still in love with San Antonio. I, I can't believe I pinched myself, you know? I literally get off a plane sometimes from a work trip. I go home, take a shower really quick, throw on my traje and go gig with the Campanas de America. Yeah. And like for me, I grew up listening to Campanas. They weren't called Campanas back then, right? And, and Juan Ortiz tells a beautiful story and I'm not gonna steal his thunder of how they changed their name to Campanas de America. But, you know, they used to be called something else, but I knew them way back then. And then I would see them play at the Hollywood Bowl, and I would see all their recordings, and I would see their, you know, their videos, and Reinalda Reinalda, <laughs> you know, with little Joe, yes. and with Johnny Canales, and I'm like, I, I know these guys, these are my brothers, my sisters. And then all of a sudden to be in San Antonio, and then to, to really have the privilege of, you know, stepping on the stage with, you know, Campanas de America, and then a bunch of new talent that's, that's you know, like, making us look like we got to practice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's been like really cool. Really cool. Yeah, every now that I think about when you introduced to your brother, mm -hmm. and he said something about great things about me, I was like, dang, like, yeah. you feel really good. Yeah. And I think about it every now and then when I'm feeling down, like, you know what? Richard believes in me. Absolutely. <laughs> Richard believes in Richard me. Richard believes in me, I can do it. It's going to be all right. Yeah, it's it's going to be okay. Absolutely. Well, you know, the thing about it is that you know, mariachi music, you know, there, there are people that, that will say, well, you know, mariachi music's all about who, who plays what and who plays better. Who play no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Mariachi music is about the ensemble. Right. And in fact, when I was teaching in, in the youth group, I would, I, I would rarely go to competitions. Not because I didn't think my kids could do well. It's because, you know, for me, competitions were on Friday nights when, you know, high school A plays high school B on football, somebody's right. going to yeah. win, Yeah. right? For me, it was never about that. It was about compañerismo. Mm -hmm. we're, we're compadres, we're com compañeros mm -hmm. so, and, and compañeras. So for me, it was all, I always wanted my students that were learning mariachi not to look at it as a competition, but always to look at it as if they were part of this bigger family. So that if you play violin, you, you, you better know how to play your violin. Not just el son de la negra, but know your scales, know how to play in tune, know how to transpose into different keys, right? Play your instrument, know the fundamentals of your instrument, because that's going to allow you to then interpret our music uh, in a, at a very high level. Yeah. But that means that, you know, like when I texted Anthony and I said, hey, bro, do you have a recommendation for, for a barber? Mm -hmm. It's not because, yeah, uh, you're a better mariachi than me or I'm a better mariachi than you. It's about we're brothers. Right. We play mariachi. We know each other through mariachi. We're yeah. compañeros, yeah. right? And that's the thing, you know, and, and, and it's been solidified in my mind everywhere I've ever lived that if you, if there's a mariachi, where, wherever you are, if there's a mariachi and you got your axe or you borrow their axe, like, you're going to make music. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it's not a competition. It's like, oh, there's another one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> Come on in. Right. It's a compañerismo. That's really what I, 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 I want for our younger generation to understand that you're part of a bigger movement. Right. Um, and by the way, you don't have to sacrifice 
your mariachi roots to do anything else. Like, I want you to be an engineer, and I want you to kill it yeah. in engineering, but I still want to be able to go out there and sing El Rey with you. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Always, right. Yeah. right? That, that you don't give up who you are. I think that's just really important for all of us to yeah. understand. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I think about, like, you know, like, if I get a job and I have to quit it, then it's going to be like, I don't want that to happen. That's like a big fear of mine. Like, mm -hmm. I always want to keep playing. Well, you know, I, I've, got a, I've got a twin brother, love him to death. His name is Ruben. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ruben. And then my brother-in-law, Jim. Jim! Mm. White chocolate! <laughs> 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 love him to death. But, you know, they've lived all over the world. Oh. And my brother's a CEO of a, of a, of a beauty, of several beauty care companies, and they're based out of New York. But they've chosen to live in San Antonio. Yes. Right, so Ruben will tell the story of how, you know, his his career. He he's really really been so busy at building these organizations, building these companies, uh, in some very big, big corporations like global corporations, and he didn't take the time to, you know, pay attention to his music, and now that he's in San Antonio where he gets to take time. Like, he's practicing his violin, he's practicing his, his guitar, he's singing, like, we get together, we do some jam sessions, um, and he feels like he, I'm not going to speak for him, but I'm going to speak for him because he's not here, but he feels like he's coming back to his roots. Right. Like, that's what it's about. That, that's that's your comfort zone. I love that. Yeah, yeah. He, he sings like it's all, like, he loves to sing. Yeah. He loves to sing. Yeah, he sings better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that must be awesome having to grow up with, or not having to, but getting to grow up with a sibling right. who also kind of shares that same musical. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really been a blessing, um, and you know that, and I think that's another thing. I mean, I saw your first your first episode where you guys were talking about orchestra, right, and mariachi, yeah. and kind of juggling all of that stuff. I thought that was really cool because, you know, in band, you know, my brother and I both performed in band. So in band, I played saxophone, Whoa. and my brother played trumpet, right? From fourth grade on, um, except when I got to high school, I didn't play the saxophone. I played the sexy phone. But it, <laughs> doo -doo -doo. <laughs> but I played saxophone. He played trumpet. Uh, but in the mariachi, you know, at first we both played guitar, mm. and then he played violin. And I played guitarron, and so like we would we would go to Friday night, you know, marching band, and, and he's playing trumpet, I'm playing saxophone, and then we, you know, Saturday we go do a gig, and I'm playing, you know, guitarron, and he's playing violin. Uh, so you don't have to choose. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's the big thing. That's right. You you just make you just make it happen, yeah. right? And, and I, my thing is, the more that you play, the better it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No. You absolutely. understand everything. Yeah. The more experience you get. You know, kind of, circling back a little bit, that's kind of one of the reasons that I prefer like the mariachi environment over kind of what I went through like middle school, high school with like the band environment because I it, it it made me think about it like it was really the whole time competition oriented. Yeah. Like, we were just kind of working towards, that let's just make sure, yeah, yeah no, just make chair, sure no, that, no. I, A, that I'm working towards first chair, that, like, the whole band is, like, yeah. first place in our division. It wasn't really, like, well, let's just play music, you know, so, you know, just to play good music. Right, like, a lot less brotherhood. Yeah, it was more just kind of, like, like I'm the it best. felt like business almost, kind of, yeah. like, just sit down, hammer it out, play it the best you oh, can. Get it done, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just get it done, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, no, Mariachi is definitely, it has, like, that. Real like, good. You have a real tight bond with the people. Camaraderie, family. It's it's a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean it's some good. I mean I can remember as a teacher when I was teaching, you know, at Pueblo, um, and and I had a mariachi program, and, and we would have our fall concert and our spring concert. And I remember the spring concert. Eventually, the mariachi program got so big that the band orchestra and choir teacher came to me and said, "Hey, look, Richard." Um, you know, the program's so big that when all the mariachi parents come to this, the, the concerts, there's no room for anybody else, right? We, we have limited capacity. Yeah. So so I remember that um, I said, they, they asked me, so it was a spring concert, they said, would you mind if 
the mariachi program did their own concert for the spring, right? And I had a beginning ensemble, I had an intermediate ensemble, I had the advanced performing ensemble, mariachi Aslan. And I said, you know, like most people could, most people would have been like really offended, like, how dare you disinvite us from the spring concert? I'm like, cool, no problem. I understand completely, no problem. It's all good. So our spring concert, we called it, because it's in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. The month of May falls in the spring. Yeah. So we called it Serenata a Nuestras Madres. That was our spring concert. La Serenata a Nuestras Madres. The parent group went all out. They made food. They had champurrado. They had hot <laughs> chocolate. You know, and, and, and then every, every mother that came, every grandmother that came, they got a rose. We, we packed it two nights in a row, that two auditorium. And it was all serenata las madres, right? Part of our culture. But the reason I tell that story is not necessarily because it was an entrepreneurial success, which it was, <laughs> but it was, I saw these tough kids, like tough guys, mm -hmm. right? Like the guys that, they never smile because they're just too tough to smile. Uh, All of a sudden, they're playing, they're playing, and then we say, we're going to do La Serenata a Las Madres, and they get off stage, and they go into the audience, and we play Las Mañanitas for all the mothers and grandmothers and stuff, and they're playing, and they have to find theirs. So they're going up there and playing for their grandmothers, singing Las Mañanitas, and they're crying, yeah. and grandma's oh, crying, oh. and mama's crying, and stepmama's crying, <laughs> and tia's crying. I mean that connection to mm -hmm. our culture, right? I think that's really, really important, and I think that's what these kinds of programs do. So in that, you know, I, I don't besmirch, you know, the, the whole competition and the UIL, UIL and all that. Hey, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. But how do you capture what I just described you know, by auditioning and getting first chair? Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, or like in a competitive environment. Cool. First chair. So what? Right. Right. Yeah. Like so, <laughs> so yeah. again, and I'm not besmirching because I have tremendous respect for all the music teachers out there and, and, and the program. What I will say, though, is that <coughs> that's what I think separates and transforms what we do in mariachi programs uh, from perhaps other kinds of programs is that it really is bridging that cultural divide and generational divide. I mean, you have a tough mm -hmm. guy kid in high school that's crying, serenading his mom and his grandma for the other las madres. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's life changing. Yeah. So I think that's kind of what's important. Absolutely. So like, how did the, how did the, the playing aspect start for you? Like, when did you start learning? Right. So my dad was a guitar player. And my dad was a, a really good guitar. He wasn't a mariachi, though. He played, he had an electric guitar, a Fender, with F holes. I got to show you the guitar. I just got it refurbished. Oh, oh. Uh, And he used to, there's a, a guitarist um, that used to exist in, in Mexico named Antonio Bribriesca. And Antonio Bribriesca recorded a lot of albums, but he was famous because he could play the melody and accompany himself at the same time. Oh, okay. Right? So my dad was that kind of a guitarist, and he was self-taught. He couldn't read music, he really couldn't sing, but he could play the heck out of any music, right, just by ear. So I grew up listening to my dad, and when I was a kid, you know, you know, my dad and his brothers and, and my uncles, they were all very close, and I remember that, you know, every... Sometimes every week, but at least every other week, there'd be like a little carne asada somewhere. And my dad would always bring his guitar. And my uncles wanted to play guitar too, so they'd break out their guitars. And I remember I was a little tiny punk kid. And I remember I used to want to just stay there all night. Because they would go they'd go pretty late. <laughs> and I wanted to stay there and, and, and be part of the crowd, right? Listening to them play guitar and learning how to play the guitar. And I remember my dad used to say to me, Nope, you got to go to bed. It's oh. bedtime. But dad, dad. <laughs> the only ones that get to stay up are those that are playing guitar. Oh. I couldn't play guitar, so I'm like, mm. <laughs> go to bed, right? That was my impetus to learn how to play guitar. Because I wanted to be able to stay up with my dad and my uncles and be able to 
play music and play guitar with them. Yeah. Um, so I, I started playing guitar um, at so five years old. Almost like you, you uh, kind of took that as a challenge. Oh, yeah. Almost. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. the only ones to get to stay up was to play guitar. I was like, all right, well, I'll just learn how to play guitar. <laughs> so I was, remember, I was five years old, and I remember my dad, you know, tried to teach me a little bit, but he really, he really, was uh, he wasn't a teacher uh, but, but I do remember that you know eventually I messed with it but in fourth grade I had a teacher named Alfredo Valenzuela Ooh. and Alfredo Valenzuela is still doing his thing in Tucson Arizona now he's Dr. Valenzuela Ooh, and all of his kids are teachers his grandchildren play his great-grandchildren play um, but he's the one that taught my brother and I really sincerely how to play chords and how chords relate to each other and the family of chords and the first you know the one four five chords yeah. and, um, so you know i owe dr valenzuela a huge debt of, of gratitude and uh yeah but i've been playing mariachi music or music ever since then and, but i do remember my dad told me though you know if you want to play there's there's a, a group called los changuitos feos Maybe you should think about Los Changuitos Feos. And, and he's the one that kind of put us on that road to go audition for the Changuitos. How did those auditions work? Like the... I don't remember in detail. I think, I think what we ended up doing is we ended up bringing our guitars and we sat in front of the director. And I, I can't even remember what I played. I think I played El Cafetal. Porque la gente vive criticándome, pasó la vida, la, 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 la. I remember I thought it was like, you know, I, I, I thought I was like Van Halen because I was like, da, 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 ding, 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 ding. But we could, we could play chords. We could sing in tune. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, start coming to practice. And that was their audition. Now, how long were you in the Changos for? So I was in the Changuitos Fails for about four years. And then in high school, we ended up forming our own youth mariachi group called Mariachi Nuevo de Tucson, okay. and there there are some there are some guys from uh, uh, from Mariachi Cobre like Miguel Miguel Molina plays trumpet. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. he was part of Mariachi Nuevo oh. de Tucson, and uh, we formed it because you know there was just a lot of interest, not enough room in the changos, uh, and we were the first group, the first youth group in Tucson that. I can't even believe I'm saying this. This was in 1982. We were the first youth group in Tucson that accepted girls into the group. Because up until then, if you were a girl, they wouldn't let you in. Dang. Can you believe? I mean, it's crazy now. Yeah. But back then, yeah, it was it was, it was was a boy's thing. Right. Uh, so we had the first girl join in 1982, Amelia Federico. Uh, and then from there, we had some really, really phenomenal musicians like uh, Kathy... Kathy Marin, um, she, she played with Mariachi Reinas. Monica Trevino played with uh, Los Camperos. She was part of Mariachi Nuevo. Um, you know, Julie Maldonado. I mean, all these really, really talented, um, you know, young ladies that played very, very well. So Mariachi Nuevo came back to Tusa, to uh, San Antonio, I think, in 1982, and we competed. Uh, here in, in San Antonio that year and uh, got to see Mariachi Vargas again. And so anyway, the, the connection was very close, but th that's kind of how it all happened. Okay. And so like from that point on, like you only chose guitar? Or I know you say you play guitar on too, mm -hmm. but like uh, what was the one you started first on guitar? Guitar. Okay. So first was guitar and then um, and then obviously started playing vihuela. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and then I really, really loved the guitar, and and, it, and then at that time, uh, Nati Santiago was still alive, so Nati was my teacher, you know, and that's that's a connection that Roland San Miguel and I had together. Roland much more than me. Roland actually went to Mexico City and studied with Nati Santiago, and uh, and I just got to study with Nati at conferences. I would go to every conference that I could. I went to Las Cruces. You know, I would go to the Tucson conference, I come to San Antonio, and it was always I had time with Nati. Um, uh, so guitarron really, for me, became the instrument that I really, really loved. To this day, I still love it, yeah. um, but I, I love guitar as well. And then when I started teaching mariachi, because, you know, the orchestra teacher said, well, I can't teach kids to play out of tune, I'm like, 
I'm not a very violent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was, was going to ask because I've seen, I've seen videos of of you with mm -hmm. the Houston uh, mariachi like playing violin with them. And when I would tell people, they're like, Richard, yeah. Richard plays violin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and he plays it good. I learned, I learned violin, and you know, my only problem is I play violin like guitar uh, <laughs> But, but I, I really practice my violin. I learned violin. I love violin. Violin for me is one of those instruments that, if you can master the violin, man, you, you got the cure for cancer coming next because it's just that instrument that just evokes so much passion and it's so subtle, but yet it's powerful. And right. I love violin, and then uh, I also started to teach myself harp, uh, which I was horrible at, and then uh, and then some trumpet as well. Because remember, I was trying to do this mariachi program, and the band teacher didn't want to be part right. of it. The violin, yeah. the orchestra teacher didn't want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, then I'll show you. I, I can do this. Uh, so you know, I I wouldn't take me out in a gig playing violin or trumpet. <laughs> There's a very limited repertoire I have, but 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 it also helped me because. Then back in the day, they also didn't have um, arrangements, written arrangements, or those that had written arrangements weren't sharing them. No, right. No, no. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I started writing my own arrangements. Well, I needed to know the voicings of violins right. to be able to, and the bowings. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I really, really worked on on those two instruments. I love those instruments, and I'm fortunate that you know I, I'm allowed to. You know, uh, play guitar with, with campanas because I, I really love playing guitar with campana. Carlos Alvarez is a phenomenal viola player, accordionist. Roland is just a, an incredible musician, guitarron, trombone. He's, he's forgotten more than probably I'll ever know. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's just one of those things where when you're with a group of people that are not in it for the um, the glory they're not in it for their own ego they're in it to make music with friends yeah. oh my god it's like totally fun and this year we're gonna do our thing at the Hollywood Bowl bro absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's really really what I'm enjoying oh yeah it's good to hear and it was a it was a pleasure to play with you that uh, deco was that one night oh it was great it was great every time and yeah every was time. the 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 pizza we right yes yeah. yeah i remember i pulled up to that show yeah it was good it's a lot of fun Absolutely. Yeah. oh no fun. it's it's definitely a lot of fun i mean this is a, like, the crowd's always the crowds are nice we have a great crowd and you know we're we're, we're very fortunate that we have people that really follow us mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are very very much about you know, supporting the music and, and supporting Campanas. But I'll tell you what, I mean, you go to a Campanas Christmas party, it's not just Campana members, it's oh, it's no. former Campanas members who are now part of this mariachi and part of that mariachi and yeah, this mariachi. mariachi. Or, I mean, it's like this crossroads of mariachi musicians from San Antonio that are, we're all connected in one way, shape, or form. Right. And it's mm -hmm. not about you play, so I can't be with you or I can't do this. It's like we're all together. And you know where? The, the one place I saw that so powerfully was when we said goodbye to Miss Bell. Yes. When Miss Bell passed, before she passed, where everybody came and everybody played for her. And uh, uh, and then when she passed, you know, her, her memorial and her burial. And you had this rainbow of mariachi trajes from, from all these different mariachis. And everybody was just, again, on multiple levels, right? Right. It, it, it was a compañerismo. It's it doesn't matter what mariachi you play with. We all knew what to play. It's I, I, you know I still I still I still remember people would say okay we're gonna do uh, amor eterno uh, in re and then boom yeah right so that's beautiful and for me that's what's so beautiful about what we do in terms of mariachi music right it's very yeah. it's like a it's all language it's universal if you know it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's universal, and, you know, my compadre Anthony uh, said it probably the best. He said, you know, mariachi music accompanies you in all of the life's biggest moments, from birth yeah. to death, right? And everything in between, there's a place for mariachi music. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. I know you guys watch videos, too, man. There's, uh, I'd, I would encourage anybody that's wanting to understand mariachi music, to watch videos, yeah, mm -hmm. that's all they do on, on YouTube. There's, there's, there's 
a plethora of videos. Like and Anthony got Bonus performance. Yeah, <laughs> ever. Shout out Anthony. Oh, he's, he's done yeah, a Anthony really great yeah. job. Is that his channel? Yeah, keeping, yeah. keeping yeah. the digital it's archives. Very like yeah, well it's organized, good. very well archived. Help me learn a lot too. I'm like, damn, how do we play this? Like, oh, okay, I listen up. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> no, man. honestly, like I, Same. I find myself sometimes like kind of like how football players like they'll watch their tapes. Yeah, watch so, like, yeah, like yeah. I'll go, I'll just look up performances and stuff, and I just kind of watch it from from their their commercials. Yeah, Don Pablo to like <laughs> awesome. everything. He has, he has every bit of, of Campana's history that you could yeah. you could uh, want to see on there, and that's that's so vital, I think, for mariachi history in general. It's beautiful, yeah. and, and 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 you know what? I, I and I couldn't agree with you more. I think you know my compadre has done a great job of really archiving you know the Campana's history, but he also has beyond Campana. Right. So he has some great oh, yes. videos of Maria Chivargas in the early years. Like yes. practicing too. Going, you know, and, and rehearsals. And he's got videos of Sol, of Sol de Mexico. He's got videos of Los Camperos. He's got video of Maria Chinova de Calitlan. And, you know, and, and I would recommend anybody that's that's really, really learning the mariachi genre, look at as many different mariachis as you can. Oh, yeah. Right. And understand what they're doing. I mean, I was watching a video the other day of Alejandro Fernandez. And you thought, you, you know, everybody's going to look at it like Alejandro Fernandez. But I was looking at his mariachi. Yeah. And yeah. They, were, they were in a palenque, and they were all sitting in a circle. He was singing songs in the key of B natural. Oh. Not B flat. Yeah, five sharps. Oops. Oh. B natural. That guitarron player, man, was yeah. like, like this. <laughs> right? He was the and, whole time. Right? And it sounded beautiful. Oof. And so I think you learn from every, every time you see... You know, a video you learn something from that video, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say another thing, of, another story. So when I was in Tucson, so we came in 1979, and then in 1983, uh, Tucson started its own mariachi festival based on what they had seen in San Antonio. They said, "Well, we want to do this too." So they started the Tucson International Mariachi Conference (TIRC). Yes. Also, ours was first. Yours yeah, first ah. in the world. Okay. In the world, that, 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 that. it had never existed before, right here. Okay. So, 1983, obviously, I already had a relationship with, you know, the members of Mariachi Vargas because I had been seeing him for several years in San Antonio. Right. Um, and we get to Tucson, and sure enough, Mariachi Vargas, but then they also had other Mariachi Machis, Los Galleros from L.A., mm. or Pedro Rey yes, was the director. Uh, and Jose Hernandez was a trumpet player and a ranger. Yeah. And then later, Sol de Mexico. And so, I mean, the Camperos. I mean, all of these mariachis. It was phenomenal. But we had this affiliation with Mariachi Vargas. So I remember I was um, 16, 17 years old, had my driver's license. And I remember that Pepe Martinez and uh, uh, Nati Santiago and El Pato, Victor... Victor Cardenas. <laughs> Victor Cardenas. The three of them wanted to go to this department store because they wanted to buy some stuff to take back to Mexico with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the official conference van wasn't available, so I said, I'll take you. So I remember we got into my 1970 Chevy Impala. Oh, <laughs> oh goodness. Now think about this. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, right now, like, I freak out nowadays because I think of the weight and the responsibility I had on my 16, 17 year old shoulders. And I had <laughs> Pepe Martinez, Nati Santiago, and Victor Cardenas in my vehicle. And I'm driving them to a department store. And these are like the legends of Maria Chivargas. And I'm driving them. So, like, I better like be, be safe. Thank God nothing happened. <laughs> um, but it became the thing where, you know, my brother and I and a couple other friends in Tucson. Like when they wanted to go out and, and, and find stuff, like we became their drivers. I see. And I heard so many incredible stories from them, just talking to them. You know, I, I remember talking to um, Mario Santiago, and he talked about after World War II, when, you know, the world was trying to heal, and Maria Chivargas was invited to go to, to Europe and play, and then they were invited to go to, uh, to Egypt. And they played for the Yaga Khan. Wow. And it was Mariachi Vargas. 
And then Mariachi Vargas was taken to Paris, and they played in Paris. I think there's a video on yeah. that in YouTube. Yeah, I think so. Where they play in Paris, and Miguel Martinez is on trumpet. And it's like all of these stories about, you know, and then stories about, like, what was it recorded? Like, I remember Pato telling the story of when Jose Alfredo Jimenez, this was from Pato, and I'm quoting Pato. Ooh. And I don't know if it's true or not, but Pato <laughs> said it was. Okay. But he said that Jose Alfredo Jimenez used to get these ideas for songs and he would write them on a, on a napkin and that you know every now and then he'd have all these napkins with with lyrics and they'd get two three four bottles of their favorite adult beverage right. and they'd lock themselves in a house or they'd lock themselves in a hotel room and then he would sing and but they would would put the chords to the lyrics and the rhythm to the lyrics and then they would write it, write it out, and that's he said that's how el rey became el rey. Wow! Right. Yeah. So it was him and Pato. So like hearing all these stories that they mm -hmm. would tell about, you know, these luminaries in, in 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 the music world. You know, as a 16, 17 year old kid, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. But now as a year old, <laughs> I think it's like, how blessed was I to have been able to uh, be yeah. like in their presence. At, at such a young age too. Mm -hmm. You had to drive them around. Drive them, I drove them all over Tucson. Uh, <laughs> and, and, the chauffeur. and sometimes it was good I drove them because they... Yeah, hey, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, those kinds of experiences, I just feel very blessed about being able to have done that. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and have gotten to know them uh, that way. I got to know them that way. Um, you know, the only one still alive in that story is, is Pato, you know. Uh, I still remember I was in Vegas, you know, where I was working in Vegas. And I remember that Mariachi Vargas was in Vegas and I was gigging with a group. They were all, they were all Mariachi teachers. Uh, and the name of the group was Mariachi Plata de Las Vegas. And I was playing guitarron. And I remember we, were, we had a planta at a restaurant. And I was a high school principal, so I got out of school and I went, got my traje, went to the gig. And we're gigging at this one, and who walks in? Four of Mariachi Vargas walks in. Because they had really good camarones, and they had ostiones and everything at this restaurant. I remember they came in, they sat out, and giving us hugs, and how are you doing, y que como están, y que la cosa, y, eh. and we're buying them shots, and we're buying them drinks. Next thing I know, we're playing. Next thing I know, Pato stands up, and he walks over, and I think he's going to ask for a song, and he asks my friend, Javier Trujillo, me presta la vihuela. Ooh. So Pato takes the vihuela. He said, get un son. I don't remember what song we played. I think it was Las Indias or something. <laughs> and I'm playing guitarron with Pato playing vihuela next to me. Like, I don't know. Like <laughs> surreal. Like crazy. Like, that's Pato. That's Pato. What key am I? What key am I? Just listen. What key am I? But just, I mean, those those kinds of experiences are, are those are the things you remember, right? Mm -hmm. It's priceless. Right. It's what makes mariachi mariachi. And I remember yeah. even like last month, like, uh, like it's it's been like, and I said this like a few. I think maybe it was another first episode where it was kind of like I really like kind of fell head first into yeah, this whole absolutely my Mariachi thing like December okay so August September October December was like my third month ever playing like Mariachi music and I was playing like with basically you know like all Capanas mm -hmm. like you had JBO in the corner singing I was playing the accordion yeah. like it's though that's the kind of stuff that you like it, it sticks with you it's, right sure it's awesome right and and you're part of the group, right? You're you're making music. Yeah, you're part yeah. of the family. Like, that's that's all. That's that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly what it is, guys. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 We're, 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 stories. we're at a good stopping point. This is. Yeah, I mean, like, thank you. I mean, so Absolutely much for great taking the time to just really talk appreciate and, you just telling me stories, man. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for keeping. That's it. really all it is, kind of. It all just boils down to just these stories about people want to know about. Mm -hmm. Richard, right? And you, you delivered. Not, 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 nothing to know except you know, do what I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. If, if I could have any, any, if I could be so bold as to make any recommendation. 
Yes, sir. You know what would be really cool one night? Is to invite um, everybody that you've had on your podcast after you've done a number of Play podcasts. And we just sit here and we just do a Noche Bohemia. No, just do a Noche Bohemia. Now, there's a, there's a Mariachi Nuevo Tecalitlan did it kind of really well. They were sponsored and they had sponsors and stuff. But they kind of did that. They just had a little Noche Bohemia and they would just sing songs and then what somebody would call in or somebody on online, they were doing it live, would say, could you please play this song? And they would just play this song. I, I think that would be so cool. Absolutely. Awesome. And it's very That's possible. Idea. In San Antonio, it has not been hard to find guests or people that are willing to <laughs> Everyone is within like 15 minutes of each other yeah, in San exactly. Antonio. It's so okay. easy to get people together to, to do something like that. I think that would be really fun. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I love what you're doing. Um, I, you, you are the, the next generation, and it's just for me. So awesome to see what you guys do, and every time I see you play, and I, and I mean, I tell my wife, I said, "Babe, you don't understand. These guys are musical. Like, these guys are musical badasses. <laughs> <laughs> play, they Absolutely sing, they play that. with Anas. I mean, they they know what they're doing, and they're good people. Like, they're Thank not, you. They're not so. out there Thank you. talking shit about people. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're not out there, you know, for themselves. Like, they, they understand that they're part of a group, and right. I, I said these are really good people. So I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for inviting me. I mean, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being on. Thanks, here. guys. Boys, Richard. I was thinking about bringing a bottle of tequila. I'm like, the vibe you want to go for. The vibe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe after like a few more episodes, maybe with you. Oh, okay, my yeah, God. a couple, couple more months, we can figure that out. All right, guys. All right, guys. Thank you. All right. We'll do a little sign out. Sign out. All right. Dang, what a episode.